Dear students and participants of this course on Railway Engineering, we are now moving forward and today our discussion is going to be centered around gauges. In the previous lecture, we discussed about the permanent way, the requirements of the permanent way, the classification of the track on the basis of the speeds and then towards the end, we discussed about the single line and double line broad gauge track wherein the various components which are used in construction of a track like the formation level and above formation level, the ballast cushion, the sleepers, the rails, what are the sizes which will be there in terms of the widths, the slopes, in the cutting or in the embankment, all those things have been discussed. Now today, when we are going to center about the gauges, there are different aspects which can be talked. First of all, we will be talking about the definition and then we will see how the railway gauges have been used around the world. You will find that they are not the same. There are different type of gauges which have been used in different countries. Then the next thing which we are going to talk is the factors which influence the selection of the gauges. Another important aspect is and has been experienced in India is the use of multiple gauges and the problems which has arised because of that use. So, we will also talk about this particular aspect. Now, this aspect has driven the government in 1992 to adopt a uniform gauge policy and this is what I also discussed in the lecture 1 and lecture 2 and given you some information about it. Towards the end, we will be talking about the loading gauge and the construction gauge which are very specific items not exactly related with the distance between the rails but is related with how the wagons are loaded and how the things are being used in the case of a construction. Now let us start. Let us start with this gauge definition. Now gauge definition as you can see here. There is a rail being provided on this side as well as there is another rail which is being provided on the other side. This is the foot of the rail and this is the head of the rail and there is a distance, clear distance which we can say between these two heads and this is what is being defined as the gauge. So, it is the clear spacing between the two parallel rails placed for the construction of a railway track and as well as for the movement of the trains. Obviously, on the basis of this, you will find that the wagons which are being constructed, or the locomotives which are being constructed and they are having their wheels, the wheels are going to work in this particular fashion on this side and similarly in this fashion on the other side. So, that means as soon as the gauge is being defined, what is the type of the rolling stock? what is the shape and size of the rolling stock probably they are also going to be defined by this particular aspect. If we look at the various types of track gauges which have been used across the world, you will find that there is a wide variety and that is being shown here. You can see that they are starting from 600 mm and this is going to as high as 1676 mm. And this 1676 mm which otherwise can also be denoted as 5 feet 6 inches is a gauge which is being used in India. And with respect to this 1676 there are two more gauges one is 1668 another one is 1600 mm. So, they can fall in the similar category. So, one category can be defined here in this form. Then another one is related to 1520. 1435 and 1372. Now, this 1435 if you remember in the previous lecture we did talk about it and we said that this one is a standard gauge and there is a variation within this standard gauge with respect to uh, this value there is two other value 1520 and 1372. Then apart from that if we go down we have the narrow gauges the usual way of using the narrow gauges again as we discussed previously was 1000 mm, but there is also 1067 and 914. 
and then we go down then we have two more gauges one is 762 and 600 mm. So, this is a big variety which is available of course, when you select all of these and when we were talking about the selection factors or considerations we will found that the conditions at the ground level will also govern that which particular gauge we should adopt and implement. Here there is another diagram wherein the different countries have been shown, they have been color coded and those colors they are associated with the particular gauge which is being adopted in that country. Say if we start with India which has a, a light green color being shown and that is also there in the case of uh, say Argentina. Now, this particular one if you go on the right hand side you found that that is the extreme corner and this extreme corner is related with 1676 gauge. Now, let us look at this particular figure. Now, here are two things which have been shown one on the right hand side another is in the center and these are correlated. This figure gives you an idea about the various black gauges which have been used across the countries in the world. Say if we start with India and if we look at the extreme corner in the diagram which is being given on the right hand side, the light green color it associates with 1676 mm of the gauge and the same has been used in the South America, the Argentina. So, this is one gauge which is being used in two of the countries. Now, if you say in India, it is also being used in Pakistan. And the similar color if you go towards a bit darker side then it is a bit lower than 1676 which is uh, uh, another broad gauge uh, gauge which is being used here and this uh, you can see uh, here. Now in the case of uh, various other countries where the blue color is being shown say you talk about uh, the North America, you talk about China, you talk about Europe, you talk about Australia some portions of Africa, then this is a blue color if we go to that then that comes out to be 1435 meters that means a standard gauge is being used here. If we see Russia then the gauge which is being used here is 1600 mm a bit different than what we are using in India or what is being used in the other countries where the standard gauge is being used. Again if we see half of this Africa then half of this Africa is being using a gauge which is again a bit different than the normal standard gauge being used. So, that means there are a large variety of uh, gauges which have been used depending on their requirements depending on whatever are the uh, type of development they assumed perceived and then implemented. Here there is another diagram. And in this one again the networks have been shown and those networks are again color coded. So, if we start from the bottom and we take 1676 mm which is being shown in a yellowish shade then this is provided here this is also being provided in some parts in this continent. But if you go to 1668 or 1600 then you may find that there are color codes different color codes which are here as well as here and some part of Australia also is having this type of a color code. That means the broad gauge is being used but not the normal one which is being used in India. If see you see this red color this red color is 1524 a big area is being utilized by that along with the 1520. So, these are the two things which are being considered you can see that there is a bit difference of color here and then the bigger network is of the same color. If you talk about Southeast Asia, if you talk about Europe, if you talk about North America then we are at this point which is 1435 the standard gauge which I have talked to you in the previous slide also. So, this is a overall network which is available but there are many countries say if you see here in this area or if we see in this particular reason we find that the railway network is not available or the railway network is not available in the to more north 
of the North America or if you are going north of Canada or Alaska. So, there also there is a issue. Similarly, in Australia too, a major portion is there which is not being connected by the railway network. Now, let us come to how we are going to select a railway track gauge. Now, this is going to be decided on the basis of first of all the cost. We are going to implement the biggest one or you are going to implement the smallest one, the cost is going to be different. Another one is a traffic consideration. What type of traffic, what amount of traffic, what is the load? So, that also is going to decide that what type of gauge needs to be selected. And lastly, the physical features of the country will also define whether we can go for the biggest one or the smallest one. Say, if we talk about the third component here, which is physical features of the country, what it says is the gradients, curves, bridges and tunnels, they become the important aspects which needs to be taken care of while deciding or selecting a gauge. Now, if we say that we are talking in an area which is something like this, a rugged area, hilly area and there we need to provide the rail network so as to reach to the top of the hill. Now, in this case, the gradients needs to be decided. In the previous lecture, we did talk about that the gradients should be gentle and they should be uniform. So, that means we cannot have a gradient which goes in this form and then we directly reaches here. It is going to be a very steep gradient and if we talk about a full load of a train which can be 1000 tons, then in that case it will be difficult for the locomotive to haul it. So, this is one aspect and when we are talking about curves, bridges and tunnels, say in this case also another important aspect is how much space is available for cutting at different points. So, at this point or at this point wherever the cutting is required and it may not allow us to go to a bigger gauge which is a broad gauge which is of 1676 mm size and instead we need to go maybe the narrow gauge or the hill gauges uh, so as to be providing the connectivity between the two locations which are apart by certain heights. Similarly, in the case of tunnels too, you have to dug it. So, how much space needs to be dug in the horizontal direction, in the vertical direction? Vertical direction is going to be decided on the basis of the height of the wagons and the locomotives and the clearances which needs to be provided alongside that. And the width is going to be decided on the basis of gauge. So, here if this is the total width which we are requiring for a, say the a broad gauge, in the case of a hill gauge then maybe the requirement is very less. So, this will also define. Similarly, in the case of bridges, whether there is a change in terms of the cost, we are going to talk about that particular component just in the next slide where we will be taking up cost considerations. So, physical features also have a say in deciding what particular gauge needs to be selected. Now, let us look at the cost considerations. We are going to provide a new connectivity. So, the very first thing which will come as a commodity there is the land. Now, what is the cost of the land? If you are talking about a built up area, if you are talking an area which is very near to the development then in that case you may find that the cost is very high and if you acquire it and you have to pay for it even as a government agency then this is going to be a very big component. So, this is one consideration here and has been a point in the selection of the meter gauges or the narrow gauges when we started developing the railways in India from the British period onward. Along with this, when we say that we are going for a broad gauge, then what amount of earthwork needs to be done? This is also another important aspect. So, you will find that the more area is to be occupied and therefore, the earthwork requirements in terms of uh, the digging, in terms of uh, stabilizing, in terms of then putting the material there is going to be much different. We have discussed about the single track, we have discussed about the double track, we have talked about what is going to be the formation width. In one case, 
above 7,800 mm on the case more than 13,000 mm. So that defines that how much earthwork is going to be involved in that. And similarly, the components, the components in terms of what type of sleeper is to be provided, what type of rail is to be provided, what is going to be the cushion of the velast below the sleeper. So what it says is, as we keep increasing the gauge from the smallest to the highest one, there is going to be a proportional increase in all of these components. So this is one aspect. Another aspect is bridges. Now in the case of bridges, it is being observed that the total width which is going to be taken up, that is not going to make a much difference in the case of the construction activity and the cost to be incurred on the construction of that particular bridge. So there is only a marginal increase because many of the things the deck etc. needs to be decided on the basis of the possibilities that tomorrow there may be a requirement of upgrading a smaller gauge to a bigger gauge. So the bridge cannot be constructed again and looking at that particular scenario or those particular condition you will find that the bridges needs to be constructed with all those weights which are required otherwise for the bigger bridges and here when we are talking about bigger gauges we say broad gauge. Then buildings and signals, now these are the commodities which needs to be there. So if you are going to operate a system there will be a building, it is not going to be affected by whether you are operating a broad gauge or you are operating a meter gauge or a narrow gauge. Similarly the signals have to be provided, their sizes their functionalities are not governed by the selection of the gauges. So therefore, there is no change in the cost. Rolling stock, this is independent of gauge. This is being decided on the basis of what gauge is there and accordingly you have to use that. So we cannot consider it as a cost consideration here. So when, as soon as we have decided we are going for a broad gauge or we are going for a meter gauge. So rolling stock is going to be a different in that sense. Then another consideration is traffic, how much amount of load is going to be there, how many passengers are going to be moved, how much amount of freight is going to be moved from one location to another location. So number of passengers, the gross million tons of the freight which is to be transported. So those things if we go for a wider gauge allows us to transport more. So high volumes can be transported if you are going for a higher sizes of gauges because those higher sizes of gauges will change the rolling stock and that change will come in terms of the coaches and wagons which we are going to utilize for the transportation. And as soon as the sizes of these coaches or wagons are increasing, it means it allows us to ferry more number of passengers, it allows us to transport more of the freight from one location to another location. Another aspect is that if we are talking about a smaller gauges, narrow gauges or hill gauges, then stability is one issue. There is a movement of a train at a speed and the winds are also blowing, in that case this uh, aspect becomes more important. So when you go to a wider gauge, say a broad gauge, it allows for that stability and allows for the speed increase also. So when the speed increases, there is a faster movement and the travel time is going to be reduced, it also has an indirect impact on the GDP of the nation. Then if you talk about signaling or the traction equipments, in the case of a traffic, whatever traffic is there, now that has to be there if you have to go for signals, if you go for interlockings, if you go for any other devices which needs to be provided on the track, they have to be there, so it is independent of the gauge. Now other operating cost per ton kilometers, it reduces with a wider gauge because you have traveled the same distance but you have taken more commodities with you and because more of the amount or more of the passengers have been transported from one location to another location, so the total cost in terms of per tons kilometer or in terms of passengers being hauled from one location to another location. Uh, that improves a lot. Now let us talk about the problems which any country can face if they are adopting multi gauges. So they have all the gauges which are possibly there. So whatever has been shown here, 
these gauges are available in our country. And then what are the issues with that? The very first thing, let us talk about the passengers who are going to be transported from one location to another, say from A to B and then they have to finally reach C, whereas A, B is a broad gauge and B, C is a meter gauge section. So, what are the issues which are going to be there? Very first thing at this location station B, there is a change of platform. And because the type of the rolling stock is different, type of the permanent stock is different here. So, here in the case of the two platforms, wherein one platform is dedicated to broad gauge, another platform is dedicated to meter gauge, there will be a requirement of crossing from one platform to another platform by way of a say a foot over bridge. So, this becomes another hindrance when we are going for a multi gauge system. The material has to be transported. So, there is a hauling of luggage. It may be required that if the manpower is not available there, then in that case you have to do it by yourself. Otherwise, if the manpower is available, then they can haul your luggage to the other platform. But another important issue is that the train which has come on the broad gauge and now you have to go to the meter gauge or a vice versa. In all of these cases, if this train arrives late, then you may find their connection is being missed. So, this is also an important aspect. You always have attention that you have to catch the train on the link line and if there is a time which is being lagging, there is a delay in the arrival, then there is an issue. Transfer during the night time is also an important issue and specifically it becomes more important for the vulnerable users like uh, women, children and if they have to move from one side to another side, it is a difficult aspect. Transshipments of goods is another problem. Now, as I said that you have this one platform wherein the lines have been used for a broad gauge and there is another platform where the lines have been used for meter gauge. Now, if the material has to be transported from this direction to this or the vice versa, then there is a possibility that damage may occur to the goods which have been transported. At the same time, during this transporting the material, there is a possibility of a theft also. Or sometimes, if the train is not available simultaneously on the two platforms, then we have to store. So, the storage facilities have to be created and those storage facilities will get created on both of the sides because if this material is going to this side, so, so first of all it will be stored here and then as soon as the specific train arrives in which it has to be loaded, then this material will be loaded and similarly there is going to be a storage on this side. Now, delays are caused in this particular case. If the train would have been there on the same platform, then the material whatever is lying here could have been transported to this side or this side depending on which particular train is to be used. Mishandling is also another important issue which may occur in this case. Then let us talk about the rolling stock. Now, because we are talking about two different type of tracks, say as an example which we have taken, there is a combination of a meter gauge and a broad gauge. So, the rolling stock is going to be different. The locomotives which are there, they will be different, the wagons will be different, coaches will be different. So, because of this, what happens is there is an inefficient use of this rolling stock. The material which has come, the train which has come with the materials or the freight, it stops there, empties it and now probably it is going back empty unless and until there is a material which is to be transported back and which has been brought up at that particular location. Okay. So, this is a problem, this empty movement, this empty movement is a having a cost, means there is an operation, but you are not gaining anything as a revenue because nothing is being taken with you. Now, another issue is that this material rolling stock will remain lying idle for a long period of time. Say, we have provided a schedule wherein the meter gauge train has been connected with the broad gauge train. Now, the meter gauge train has to arrive 
and once it arrives then only the broad gauge train will be moving. Now this is getting late. So if this is getting late and this remains standing here, it is not in use. So this is one another aspect which can be there and can also happen that this broad gauge train has brought the people and then it has moved with the meter gauge train which has a round trip. So in this round trip unless until it comes back with the people then this broad gauge train is not going back. So this type of a situation can also arise and if any of such thing happens then it is simple a waste of the rolling stock there. Now transferability of equipment is not possible between the broad gauge and the meter gauge for the obvious reasons because both are different, they have different widths, they are different type of sizes of the material which have been used as a component of the track and therefore we cannot use that okay if there is a problem on a broad gauge track we bring it from the meter gauge, if there is a problem on a meter gauge track then we can take from the broad gauge and put it on the meter gauge. Another issue is the duplication of facilities, this may also appear. Now this duplication of facilities may be in terms of say the sheds and yards because there is a difference in the rolling stock and you need to have two different yards or two different sheds where the maintenance activities of these particular rolling stock can be taken up. And when we talk about this maintenance activities then the maintenance equipment will also be a point of consideration there. Another thing is that multiple waiting rooms and spaces needs to be created on both the sides. On one side where the broad gauge lanes have been provided, on the side where the meter gauge lines have been provided. So this is another issue. As we said that if there is a connectivity between the two trains, one coming on a broad gauge, another going on a meter gauge or meter gauge versus broad gauge, then people need to uh, wait there and if they have to wait, we need to have certain spaces for that. Platforms are also going to have different specifications. The size of the rolling stock, say the wagons which are being used, the coaches which are used for transporting the passengers, they are different and accordingly the height of the platform is also going to be different in these cases. Then if you go for a future gauge conversion in these cases, it becomes difficult because in the case of a meter gauge to be converted into a broad gauge, first of all you have to take out each and everything and then the totally new material, totally new components needs to be installed. So this is also another important issue. Then hindrance to fast movement of goods and passengers wherein the delays or the emergency situations may arise because you cannot do it in a faster manner. There is a location as we discussed previously, we are moving from A to B and then connected to C where in one case it was broad gauge, in another case it was meter gauge. So now there is no possibility to move from A to C directly. And because of that, now this delay which is appearing at this connecting station B is a issue. Now hindrance to the balanced economic growth is also another important point. Now what happens is when you are using broad gauge, when you are using the bigger size of the uh, rolling stock, say the wagons etc, it means you are transporting more and if you are transporting more, it has direct correlation with the industrial growth in terms of the productions and the consumptions which otherwise are associated with it. So the industrial development will come more if you have a wider gauge as compared to a smaller gauge. The movement between points of production and consumption is also going to be an important aspect because here it will be more easier to take it as compared to the same condition as we discussed that if there is a transshipment of the material at the station B because of uh, two different tracks, then there are possibilities of hindrances, there are possibilities of thefts, there are possibilities of damages, etc, etc. Now let us come to the uni gauge policy of 1992 which was started and from there onwards the government decided that we are going to slowly convert all meter gauges or narrow gauges as far as possible based on the ground conditions or the terrain conditions in that particular area to broad gauge. Now if we do this then whatever the problems which we have discussed previously are going to be eliminated one by one and that is what we are going to discuss in these one or two or three slides. So very first thing is the elimination of the transport bottlenecks. 
what are the eliminations here there is no need of transshipment from one location to another location so we are here on a broad gauge system and we are there on a meter gauge system so nothing is to be taken here or here everything is going into that same ambit of broad gauge there are no waiting and delays in terms of these transshipments because everything is there so we can do it faster if the commodity comes through a particular train here then it gets transferred to another train on the other side as soon as it arrives so much not much waiting or delays may be there they are in elimination of the inconveniences which are being caused and the handling of luggage is also easier you need not to cross unless until of course in the case of a multi track system you need to cross from one platform to another platform but now we are providing facilities in terms of lift we are providing facilities in terms of the escalators and therefore the problems which are associated with the handling of luggage may not be there the removal of transshipment hazards it induces the better safety for all users for all type of commodities which are going to be transported this is uh, one aspect another aspect is the uh, reduces the damages thefts and mishandling of the luggages because if you are going from one side to the another side and there is a difference in the, the way it has to be transported, the, the conditions are different, then there are possibilities of these damages and thefts or mishandling which reduces, but we cannot say that they have got eliminated, they will not get eliminated, there are still possibilities even on the same platform if you are to transport from one side to the another side, platform 2 to platform 3, these things may happen. Elimination of unsafe transfers during night time. Now, because now you have one single platform, you have combination of platforms depending on the number of tracks all being lit properly and being connected properly. So, this unsafe movements will be lesser. So, there is a possibility of elimination or there is a possibility of reduction in these particular things. Now, in the previous case, we talked about that this non-efficient utilization of track and the rolling stock is there but as soon as we go for a uniform policy what happens is that higher efficiency will be achieved and his higher efficiency is in terms of the movement it is in terms of the travel time associated and it is indirectly associated with the cost of transportation so these efficiencies will be there now reduction in the operating expenses are going to be there because here we are not changing the rolling stock the same rolling stock is going to be utilized so that brings in that particular positive aspect lesser or no idling situation may be there the rolling stock will remain continuously in use of course it has to be kept idling for certain period of time and that period of time is a minimum maintenance time and that minimum maintenance period has to be there we cannot remove that so that will remain so that is why we can say that there is a lessening of those type of situations. Provision of alternate routes becomes possible as soon as this A is being connected to B and then connected to C there may be a possibility that there is a another route through which we can move directly to C without requiring to going to B. So such type of things may happen if they happen then the positive side is that it reduces the pressure on the existing network. Another thing is because the movements are faster there are different ways in which are different routes in through which we can move them so economic conditions may improve there is a possibility that if D is here then D will also starts developing along with B. So that is a situation may arise higher penetration of products will be there because now we have a flexibility to move in different directions without requiring to change the things at different locations. There is more flexibility which comes into the movements and the connectivities becomes much better. And when all of these things happens and if you look towards the economic perspective towards the people who are producing the things who are interested to distribute those two across the length and width of the country then it improves or boosts the investors confidence also. So this is 
another positive side of a unigauge policy. Now, one another thing is that when train has moved to one location to another and then it has to come back and that is what is a turnaround. So, we are going in one direction and coming back to the same location from where we started. And if this better turnaround is there, then that means we are improving upon the operational conditions, we are improving upon the utilization of the rolling stock. So, higher use of equipment will be there and it will have a reduction in the operational expenses because now the stock is continuously in use and as soon as it is continuously in use, it means the revenue is getting generated. And as soon as the revenue is getting generated, if we take it in terms of the cost and benefits conditions, we will find that the improvements are coming there. Another thing is if the better turnaround is there and there is a possibility that this train which comes out back here after moving from A to B and now it has to go maybe after 12 hours or maybe after 15 hours again on the same route. So, in that period there is a possibility that we can move it to C and it comes back from C to A again. And this happens within that particular idling time period when it is not going to move from A to B. So, this is another possibility. So, better scheduling of the operations are possible if we have a unigauge policy. Then higher user benefits will be there. We already did talk about the uh, benefits in terms of passengers, in terms of the industries and optimization of facilities are also going to be there. So, all of the facilities now because previously we said if we have a broad gauge here and we have a meter gauge here. So, the two sets of facilities will be there, two sets of yards will be there, two sets of uh, maintenance equipment will be there which are required for these two different type of a rolling stock. Now, that is not required. So, that optimization will be there, it will reduce the overall cost, it will improve upon the, uh, the utilization of those equipment also which otherwise are lying idle if that rolling stock is not available for the maintenance reasons. Balanced economic growth will come into an area and this balanced economic growth will be in terms of uh, say the reduction in the regional effects. Previously, if we have been developing something in one area only. Now, because the connectivities have improved, therefore, this whole of the system is uh, expanding laterally longitudinally and that is where this becomes a better aspect. Better and improved growth of connected and unconnected areas, this is also uh, related with the type of connectivities which have been provided and the branch lines or the other lines which are being connected with the main lines and dispersal of activities will be a possibility. Now, no multiple tracking will be there, extra facilities with different specifications will not be required. So, uh, the duplications, the multiplicity of the various things will not be there in this case. Then multiple tracks, yards, equipments with different specifications will not be required. We already talked about this particular aspect uh, previously. Better transport infrastructure is going to be there. And once better transport infrastructure is there, so efficient movements will be there. And when we say efficient movements, they are related with the travel time and the travel cost and how much minimum time period we can move commodities or the passengers from one location to another location. Then direct connectivity to different areas previously served through meter gauge or the narrow gauge networks. Now, they come into the direct connection with the broad gauge connectivity and they get connected to the different other areas of the country and higher opportunities in that sense will come to the masses who were previously deprived because they were provided with the narrow gauge, hill gauge or a meter gauge. Now, let us talk about two specific aspects and with that we will close this uh, lecture. Uh, one is a loading gauge. Now, what is this loading gauge? Here in this diagram you can see that there is some size being defined. So, there is a rail here and a rail here. So, rail level is being defined for that and then there is a height and a width being defined for those rail sets. Here we are talking about a broad gauge. So, in the case of broad gauge, this maximum height which is being defined is 4140 mm, where the width is defined as 3250 mm. What does that mean is that anything, any wagon which is being loaded, 
So, if there is a wagon which is moving here, so this should not go beyond these boundaries in the horizontal direction or beyond these boundaries in the vertical direction. So, this is a loading gauge which is provided usually at the freight locations where the freight is being transported from one to the other one. Now, moving dimensions which we are talking here is uh, basically related with the construction aspect. So, here what we do is we add the clearances to the loading gauges and those clearances when being added to the loading gauges then in that case it will come out with something like this as being shown here for a broad gauge. Here 1676 the gauge then 2440 and 3050 they are basically related with the, uh, the sleepers and the uh, ballast cushions width which are being provided. But then with respect to that what is important to see here is that the heights are being defined. So, if you go up then the height is being increased but it cannot go beyond 3250 maximum and because you have an electrified system then it not also go to beyond 4 to 6 5 mm maximum. So, this is also important and this is used in the construction of bridges, tunnels, platform sheds etc. So, this is one another aspect when we take up a construction of these tracks needs to be taken care of. So, with this we close this lecture. So, today what we discussed was the types of gauges the factors which are used in the selection of gauges, the problems which are being faced by the country because we have used multiple type of gauge system. Then the uniform gauge policy which came and what are the benefits it has given to us and finally we concluded with the loading and the construction gauges which are important in terms of the operation and construction activities of the tracks. So, we close this lecture now. Thank you and we will meet in the next lecture.